Uh, thank you. My, my name is Jennifer Holgate. I'm a solicitor at uh, Evershed LLP. We are a national law firm. Um, apologies that Michelle will be here today. Uh, she works in our Cardiff office. Uh, we have a range of clean energy and renewable specialists. So Michelle works on the funding side. Um, I work on the planning side uh, in Wales and in England. We have um, we work on all aspects of commercial anything really, to be honest, in the whole transactional <coughs> process of renewable energy. So today, um, I hope I can do Michelle uh, her, her presentation justice. I'm going to be providing a general <coughs> overview on transactional opportunity, but also picking up on this morning's presentations, the restrictions that are also occurring in Wales, and uh, perhaps more generally, and how we might look to start to try to overcome those. So looking at the bigger picture, can everyone see just about, I have to point them out, but basically this uh, pie chart shows the global mergers and acquisitions undertaken by renew the renewable energy projects in the past year. And what you'll notice is that uh, the blue is the United States, obviously a big player there. Uh, Belgium, perhaps a slight anomaly, have won an absolutely massive merger and acquisition deal in the past year. Then we've got the orange is France and we've got to Japan. The UK is actually quite a small proportion there in the uh, bottom left, which just shows really the sort of activity that's been taking place in the past 12 months. Now moving on to mergers and acquisitions by technology and renewables within uh, the UK itself. What's quite interesting here is that the major chunk in the past 12 months is related to the built environment. So energy efficiency, improvements to the home. Just, I suppose, saying what's already obvious, but this is through the, the Green Deal, which the government has spoused. Uh, in summary, it essentially meant that an energy provider would give you a loan to do improvements to your property, and then the loan would be gradually uh, repaid back through discounts to your bill, so essentially you wouldn't be out of pocket. Uh, other big players there, um, advanced transportation, so um, energy efficient cars, etc. And obviously wind. Noticeable lack of biomass in the past 12 months. Um, we're working on a couple of biomass projects at the moment in the merger and acquisition field. And we are waiting at the moment for the rock rebounding to take place. And that is what is holding all of these projects up in the next year. I will go on to talk about that. But that's one of the main reasons why uh, biomass, for example, hasn't taken place. Finally, this just shows uh, acquisitions and projects in by country again, a slightly different format, but you will see the United Kingdom is fourth from the bottom there, uh, $25 million. So we have the bigger picture, but looking now to sources of capital so far in the UK for renewable projects. So who's funding renewable energy projects at the moment and where do they come from? Well, the first are funds aggregating projects. Now, we, we, we touched briefly on this earlier. Many potential clients and clients are approaching us um, from the US and, and elsewhere, and they want to invest in a bulk or in one go in UK projects, normally onshore wind. They are specifically pension and insurance companies who are cash rich and don't need project financing. So they have a pot of money that they want to invest in a range of renewables projects, as I said, mainly onshore, they will own and operate those particular projects for their lifetime, and this will then provide a guaranteed income which can then go back into their pension fund. So the kind of companies I'm talking about here, uh, NetLife, uh, BlackRock, uh, those kinds of companies. So we're finding that that's quite a big potential market for investment at the moment. The banks. The banks are restricting the amount of lending. I think we're saying something kind of quite obvious there. Um, there have been a decrease in the number of loans, um, but the loans are currently still taking place. Uh, flexing is occurring, so the banks are asking for a higher um, return on those loans. So there's a twofold process going on there. And all of this means it's far more difficult to get debt from the banks to fund projects, and it comes down to risk. Everything in the UK is now far more risky, especially when it comes to, for example, the feed-in tariff, the rock view, etc. There isn't certainty, and the government aren't helping on a national level to create that certainty in the United Kingdom to provide the right conditions in order to invest. For example, although the FITS regime now reads, in fact, anything over about five megawatts, that still affects, I think, the credit 
reliability of our system as a whole for the long term. Now, the utilities. Utilities are apparently quite cash constrained because they've signed up for offshore projects. And to fund those projects, they have to divest of their onshore portfolios, for example, onshore wind farms. So they need cash. So often they happen to find it from elsewhere, so for example, from onshore wind farms. And alongside this, they are then providing a buy with a future right to acquire projects that haven't entered that final process in the system or haven't even been consented. Now, the final point, and um, this is quite an interesting one, I think, is uh, Chinese municipalities are wanting to invest very heavily in the UK at the moment. They are looking to invest in the whole <coughs> process of UK projects for wind turbine projects. So the planning, the funding, the building and owning of turbines. And want, they want to do this because at the moment, the top 10 wind turbine manufacturers, six of those are Chinese, which a lot of people wouldn't have heard of. But that's because we don't want their turbines in the UK at the moment because they haven't been performance guaranteed. So banks aren't willing to invest in them because they don't think that they are risk adverse. So what they want to do is stick their turbines in the UK for five years or more to provide proof of a track record, which provides the bankability that they need. So in summary, we're looking at funds aggregating and investors being an investment opportunity, whereas banks are still lending, there's less investment there, and utilities are finding it more difficult in terms of cash constraints. So in summary, perhaps obvious, there's capital C equity and debt, and any investor wants to follow a trend of the least risk and the highest reward. At the moment, Wales is perceived as too high a risk and not enough reward. So, again, we touched on this earlier, but what is the overarching focus for renewables in the UK at the moment? Security of supply, I think this will come up a lot today, but it's very important. The new EMR white paper was published in July this year. In that paper, it was made perfectly clear that if we do not address the issues of energy supply now, the lights will go out in 2017. It could not have been more clear in that document from the government. So we must be in control of creating our own electricity. <coughs> this needs to be carried out through what's described as the generation mix. We talked about this earlier, which is actually a combination of conventional energy, nuclear energy, but also renewable energy as well. Now, high stake targets to meet, uh, a few figures have been banded around. The one I'm going to use is that there is a legally binding target that 15% of electricity must come from renewable sources by 2020. So a slightly different um, statistic there. We're currently at 6.7% of that legally binding target, and we are well short. And therefore, with high stake targets, and depending on, for example, rock announcements, etc., coming up, we need to have a combination of onshore, offshore, biomass, wave and tidal in the future, and solar will also play its role. So, as I said, the technology focus is a combination of all of those listed. And I also acknowledge, um, gentlemen, earlier that anaerobic digestion is definitely a government focus as well, especially with the recent review of tariff for a more positive aspect. Now, China, for example, has approximately 10 gigawatts of offshore target that they want to meet. They will probably meet that. Ours is more in the region of 25 gigawatts for the round. So looking at that, we have a huge gap that we have to meet. Now, a lot of it is reliant on us meeting offshore in order to fund the rest, and that's how the government perceives it And for example, the EMR white paper. Looking as well, just there, picking up on a couple of points on security of supply, biomass has a big security of supply problem, and there is a clear contradiction here between security of supply and biomass going forward. The fuel you use for biomass has to be of a good quality, has to be a good supply, and the banks are relying here on the creditworthiness of your contractor. So say you have a farm municipality in Argentina to fund your wood supply to come to the UK, that is what must be relied upon. If you don't have that, you don't have a project. And we are finding that in some of the larger biomass projects that we're working on, that's the, that is one of the key issues at the moment in terms of biomass for the long term. But there are some other projects coming to the fore. Um, in Wales, looking at wave and tidal, the RWE project with a 10 megawatt tidal in uh, North Wales, uh, earlier, we there was discussion of, of uh, the Pembrokeshire um, wave and tidal project, but in Scotland, and I was pleased to hear this <coughs> announcement of the zone appraisal for wave and tidal, but in Scotland there was a round one wave and tidal lease appraisal in Pembrokeshire. 
Now, I know it's discussed earlier by Colin Jones, but this is something I think we need, really need to address with. The leasing of the afternoon particular zones is going to be very important, I think, going forward and looking at way of tidal for the future. So what are the main issues? <laughs> I think um, <clears throat> grid. It's a pretty, uh, pretty obvious one. There are obviously very long lead in times for grid infrastructure. A lot of projects are entirely prohibited at the moment from taking place. And there are also high grid connection costs associated with that. <coughs> it's not a grid connection elsewhere in the UK, mainly in the south of England, with much lower <coughs> connection costs associated with that. We've already discussed TAN 8. There are huge panel restrictions in Wales. Um, my clients, that's the principal reason why they don't want to develop larger wind turbines in Wales, well, onshore on projects, is because of TAN 8 and the panel restrictions associated with that. There are some difficulties there. I think that needs to be addressed, and it's a key concern to discuss. Now, the third point is investment. I've discussed this already. There's cash constraints from investors, and we have to consider everything previously discussed. And here it is. The main point here is uncertainty in the market. There's uncertainty in the market which creates the high level of risk. And here, the main culprit is the lack of certainty on the renewables incentives. Of course, there are rumours all the time. There's rumours that, for example, the feed-in tariff deadline will come forward from the 1st of April 2012. Um, as, as many will be aware, the feed-in tariff was slashed in August earlier this year so that 5 megawatt projects are no longer viable for solar, for example. And that was obviously big in the news, it was a big point. But now, the government's becoming nervous again um, because council are trying to take advantage from the solar rooftop um, projects. And as a result of that, they might bring it forward again. And that is creating a huge amount of uncertainty and it is a lack of reliability in the UK as a whole. Furthermore, the renewables obligation certificates, no one actually knows what the rock value will be after 2013 at the moment. Um, this, uh, well, there, it's understood there will be more announcements on this, but it's fair to say that banks can't lend without knowing the full value going forward in the long term. And again, this all fuels uncertainty to prevent development. <laughs> So looking at opportunities, and I discussed this earlier, I think, um, I've already mentioned that I think the main four uh, renewable opportunities here are on a larger scale, and I acknowledge that microgeneration is also extremely important in terms of AD, etc., would be the offshore, onshore, biomass, and wave and tidal. As I said previously, there are wave and tidal projects going forward in Wales. There's been a big impetus for more. That's definitely something that can be pursued as well. Um, Scotland's a good example, we'll probably just talk about Scotland a lot more today, but that's a good example from which we can follow the lead. And moving on, what can Wales do perhaps now? Perception. Uh, Scotland is perceived from outside investment as a renewable energy-led focused country. We haven't got that in Wales at the moment, not yet anyway. Wales are still seen as slightly too restrictive. And I think you talked about Scottish renewables earlier, and that is such a good example of something which needs to be put forward in the Russian country. That is a body that has all the information available, it's very accessible, it's something that we can work on and discuss today. Incentives. Um, we carried out a search on new energy finance before um, this presentation to look up funding, loans, investment opportunities, um, etc. For Scotland and then did the same for Wales. And what we noticed, although there are things happening in Wales, there are investment, there are funds, that in Scotland it is publicised everywhere. You know, the £17 million port in infrastructure loan that was given recently, the Soltec files, all those sorts of things were coming up. There wasn't the same amount of that publicity and incentive, probably not even in quantity, compared <coughs> to Scotland. Planning improvements, um, obviously, in my area. I see clarity on tanning is needed. I mean, I think especially whether it's going to be a review of tannings or not, I think there needs to be a firm statement in any event, um, even firmer than the Brick Saturday of July 2011, <coughs> that as take a look at there needs to be a timetable if we're going to for example, if we're going to expand the SSA, then that needs to be discussed. Are we going to keep the same? There needs to be a firm timetable on what we're going to do on this, because at the moment, clearly it's not quite working in the current system that we have. <coughs> Re-evaluation of TANE, I think that's up for discussion. Grid investment, we need to increase lead in time. I think it's not, a, it's not an easy solution, 
there are problems. Um, I think some further routing strategies probably need to be obtained in terms of upgrading to existing points. But do not doubt this is quite a significant barrier in terms of, especially mid Wales, for development in the, the Beauty Delhi line, for example, in Scotland. And that started in 2005. And because of objections, because of difficulties, that took some time. But it's not to say things can't be done. And I think that's the form to demonstrate all sorts of possibilities and strategic strategies and proposals. So in summary, I think there are options available here. I think there are possibilities. Um, but I think there are clear barriers to investment. But with that does come other routes of opportunities. I think planning, grids and investment are the three main precursors to growth, um, from my perspective, um, being planning system, being with Evershed. But I'm up for the discussion. Um, I welcome questions. If there's anything very specific, very specific funding, you know, grids, etc. There's a whole team in Cardiff who really want to be on board with this, and we're happy to catch up with anybody, telephone, meeting, whatever anyone wants. So just come and grab me, and I really want to make this work moving forward. So thank you very much for listening.